It doesn't really feel like an exaggeration to suggest that the Human Covenant War might have been one of the most pivotal dramas to ever play out across the endless myriad of alternate worlds and realities. The battles that defined the fate of entire worlds, the dogma and lies that might have doomed an entire galaxy, not to mention the struggles and sacrifices of individuals and armies. Perhaps it was inevitable then that like so many before it, we would see this story play out again, in a new and not entirely identical way. Sometimes this can be refreshing, giving us new insights, new perspectives, and new ideas, while other times these alternate realities can seem like a pale imitation. In the case of what's become known as the Silver Timeline, I can't help but feel like we're drifting towards the latter. But rather than declaring definitively that this alternate reality just doesn't work, I think it's a bit too soon for that, I'd instead like to try and give you an idea of how I personally interpreted and experienced the first episode in this new ongoing saga that is the Silver Timeline, and in particular, all the things that annoyed me. I am a man of passion after all, with strong emotions and strong opinions regarding certain elements, and for better or worse, usually worse, getting annoyed by things is how I most strongly connect to them. It is a dreadful existence, a living hell, for I am doomed to never truly enjoy anything, but such are the sacrifices I am forced to make in the service of the Templin Institute. But before we begin, I think a certain amount of context is needed here. The Templin Institute is nothing if not deliberate, and I chose the phrase annoys me for a specific reason. There's a Parisian food critic I quite like, who once expressed that we tend to thrive on negative criticism, which is fun to write and to read. But I believe it's a mistake to consider every criticism as having universe-shattering importance. Some things just annoy you, are fun to talk about, and then you move on. Not everything needs to be a big deal. Nor is it only negative things that can be annoying. Sometimes I found myself quite impressed by certain elements, only to then get annoyed that the other aspects failed to reach the same level of excellence. Other times I'm annoyed just because something wasn't the same as how I imagined it or how I would have done it. And finally, sometimes I'm just wrong. No, no, I swear it's true. There have been plenty of times where something annoys me, so I research it, and it turns out I was completely incorrect, which is actually pretty great. Our motto here at the Templin Institute is that we investigate alternate worlds. Why would we do that if we didn't think there was anything left to learn? And I must admit, my memory of events following what we're going to cover today is kind of hazy, so it's entirely possible that certain things I bring up might have been addressed and resolved further down the timeline. Whether or not they do so in a way I consider believable, well, that's a question for another time. So what I'm essentially getting at is that while most of what I'll be discussing is going to be negative, I don't consider anything I bring up to be some kind of sin. A sin is a transgression against divine law, and in these matters, only a lazy, incompetent fool would appoint themselves as the arbiter of what is and is not divine. All these are are things that annoy me, and I consider that to be the start of the conversation, not the end. Alright, so let's jump in. From here on out, I will assume that you're at least partially familiar with the UNSC, the Covenant, Spartans, and everything else in between. Okay, we didn't make it too far before the first thing that annoyed me. Never a great sign. Madrigal is described as a Tier 4 heavy water extraction planet. Whenever an entire planet is given a designation like this, it always feels rather arbitrary. Major population centers like Madrigal are way too complex and nuanced to be so easily categorized. One industry might be dominant, but towns, cities, and planets are all multifaceted entities with many different factors that contribute to their economic makeup. Sometimes you might refer to an urban center as a global city, or industrial city, or college town, but there's no firm criteria that defines what these really are. And these categorizations should only be taken as a starting point for understanding the diversity of urban economics. And this isn't the grim darkness of the 41st millennia, where entire worlds have been reduced to cogs in a machine. In reducing Madrigal to this broad classification, the UNSC is oversimplifying the economic reality of an entire planet. And sure, the UNSC can be heavy-handed and even brutal when dealing with independent colonies, but they're not idiots. This is supposed to be a sophisticated interstellar society aware of the consequences of oversimplification and familiar with the more effective, nuanced, and data-driven approaches to economic development. Oh my god, that's a lot to say about a bit of text on a screen. It might be time to grab yourself another plate of stroganoff and a new case of vanilla coke, cause we might be here for a while. Moving on, I find it strange that what appears to be a very small settlement has its own space elevator. These are immense structures, and while they're relatively common across the UNSC, they still represent a huge investment, 
and are almost always located in major urban centers that are producing or receiving a ton of materials. This one does seem to be pretty small compared to the Mombasa Tether, for example, but it's still a space elevator, and they're not cheap. The settlement itself seems more like a camp in some post-apocalyptic wasteland than a mining facility in need of its own megastructure. It seems insane to spend all this time, money, and effort building a 100,000 kilometer tall space elevator, and then you don't even pave the ground around it? It almost looks unfinished, and if that's the case, then this would go from something that annoys me to a pretty cool detail. Maybe that perimeter wall isn't a wall at all, but supposed to be the foundation of a larger space elevator, and whoever was building it just ran out of money. That would make sense. Their super weapons, the Spartans, to crush us, but war need not be the answer. Okay, next we have Vincher Grath talking about the precious deuterium that Madrigal is producing and how the UNSC won't pay a fair price. I was vaguely aware the UNSC starships use deuterium in their reactors, but I didn't actually know what this is. And I was surprised to learn that deuterium isn't some futuristic energy source or whatever, but a stable isotope of hydrogen that is naturally abundant in seawater. Plenty of planets outside of Madrigal have oceans, but Earth alone could probably meet this demand. No wonder the UNSC is not paying a good price. Everyone talks about deuterium like it's dilithium, element zero, unobtainium, or some other rare element, but it might as well be wood. Yeah, it's important, but it's not exactly rare to the point where losing one supplier is going to cripple you. I face Marines. <laughs> face Marines. All right, I don't get why these guys don't respect the Marines. Sure, they're not Spartans, but we're still talking about an extremely sophisticated interstellar fighting force. These people don't come across as very capable, so I'm really wondering what the circumstances were that led to them going up against Marines and not being immediately wiped out. All right, with this next one, this is mostly expanding on my earlier point, but the more I see of the settlement, the more out of place it seems. Working in the frontier within the mining industry is never going to be a luxurious experience, but come on. Sitting in gravel around weird-looking huts? It's not that hard to lay down cement. Okay, no one is more thrilled than I am that the Kalashnikov AK-47 is still seeing use in the 26th century, but come on, the gun is 500 years old at this point. That would be the equivalent of using a 15th century arquebus during our own modern era. The UNSC has a huge military industrial complex and has fought several wars across its history, so it's pretty inconceivable that some other easily produced reliable firearm hasn't long since replaced the old AK-47. I'm starting to think that these guys might have been lying when they said they'd beaten Marines. Their tactics here are pretty strange. Their fortress is surrounded by this big open desert, and yet they drastically restrict their own sight lines by taking up positions inside the walls rather than atop them or outside. This isn't a medieval siege. Those walls right now are helping the enemy, not the people inside them. Oh my God, God, it's all true. What? What's true? I thought it was UNSC propaganda. It's wild to me that this guy and seemingly everyone else on the planet was ignorant as to the existence of the Covenant. One of the most tragic and striking elements of the original timeline was that for the better part of three decades, human civilization was very much aware it was slowly being exterminated. There was an almost overwhelming feeling of desperation that gave the conflict real weight. I can understand this guy not trusting UNSC propaganda. We're already at the point where I'm not sure if Joe Biden and Donald Trump aren't playing Minecraft every night, but we're talking about a war in which billions have been killed, hundreds of worlds have been glassed, and Earth itself is being threatened. That's not the kind of thing it's easy to remain ignorant of. So Master Chief is holding his gun wrong. Now, I'm no expert, but I think that... You can try whenever you like. All right. Holy shit, there's a bug in the way. Yeah, there's a big one, too. X marks the spot. That was intentional. <laughs> Wait, you did that on purpose? Oh, of course. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. What, was I not supposed to aim for the X? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, I forgot. I actually am an expert marksman. Okay, so expert marksmen like me know that one of the main benefits to firing a rifle, say, over a handgun, is they are able to have more points of contact with the firearm itself, usually your trigger hand, support hand, and shoulder. Now you might argue that as a Spartan with superhuman strength, this isn't as big a deal, and you're probably right. But just because you have enhanced strength, I don't think you should use that as an excuse to use it inefficiently. Did the UNSC really spend all that money on the Spartans just so they didn't have to lock their rifles into their shoulders? 
We can actually see just how unstable these dual pistols are due to the lack of the aforementioned contact points. But the real problem here is that the Spartan strategy so far seems to be running towards the enemy while firing wildly. When your enemy seems really keen on energy swords, this seems like the worst possible option. Covenant priorities seem a little misguided here. These elites are currently defending against the UNSC counterattack, one composed entirely of what they name literal demons, and yet this guy is just desperate to kill a random civilian who's of no threat. The Covenant are nothing if not fanatical, and it's not impossible that maybe this elite was overcome by a zealotry, but the elites always seemed a bit more disciplined than that to me. I feel like they'd recognize the threat of the Spartans and react to them first. Okay, so I seem to recall that General Jin Ha used that exact same rotary machine gun when the Covenant first entered the settlement to very little effect. But now in the hands of the Master Chief, it's doing some real work. I suppose maybe the shields of the elites have been drained over the course of the fighting, but that still seems a little strange to me. No! No! And again, the tactic of running towards the Covenant is being heavily favored here. If you're trying to draw the enemy away from civilians, better to try and lure them somewhere else. I suppose in the heat of the action, it's easy to forget to look at the situation objectively, but this guy is supposed to be a general, so it's quite literally his job to think tactically and strategically. Lake Command, Silver Team. Master Chief identifies himself as part of Silver Team here, and this touches on something that annoyed me in the original timeline as well. In modern militaries, anything smaller than a platoon is usually considered a sub-subunit. These Spartans would likely be a fire team. The issue is, sub-subunits are usually ad hoc and temporary in nature, which is why they're not given official names and insignia. They're formed and disbanded as required by the parent unit based on the specific mission or task at hand. They're not intended to have a long-term existence. The size of military formations doesn't have a lot to do with the physical strength or endurance of the people within them, so I wouldn't expect the fact that these are Spartans to change that up too much. Covenant forces on planet Madrigal neutralized. After shooting the final Covenant warrior, it takes Master Chief 17 seconds to declare that the entire planet has been pacified. I don't know how he could possibly know that given his limited perspective. The only way he could be so confident is if his team had perfect knowledge on the Covenant's numbers and disposition before they engaged them. But I'm pretty sure he's only saying that because he stopped getting shot at and just kind of assumed. 20 elite warriors killed, 150 civilians, no survivors. Wait! And I say that because right after, he's again quick to say that there are no survivors and then is immediately proven wrong. In any job, but in the military especially, thoroughness ensures accuracy and completeness in reporting critical information. Whereas Master Chief just seems to be winging it. Like he didn't even do a search, he just kind of looked around. Silver Team, commencing comprehensive search of the area for enemy landing site. Okay, so this is going to be a recurring annoyance. But rather than address it again and again, let's just get it out of the way now. The way these Spartans talk to each other doesn't really feel like how a military unit would communicate. They have this directness and simplicity that I think is actually pretty indicative of how orders are given, but it seems like they take it just a bit too far. As an example, the chief here says he's conducting a comprehensive search of the area, which feels like it could be interpreted in a number of different ways. If Silver Team disappeared, and this was the last transmission received, he hasn't given any context on where he's actually going. I feel like there should have been some map coordinates or a cardinal direction or even a landmark referenced here. This dialogue instead feels like someone pretending to be competent without really knowing what competency looks like in this situation. This is a pretty narrow path, but not so narrow that you need to be in single file. These Spartan super soldiers are approaching an enemy ship with an unknown enemy presence and doing it in such a way that the line of sight of three quarters of the squad is being blocked. They're also very close together. In the business, they call that gaggle fucking. Even Lieutenant Gorman knew better than that. Watch your spacing. All right, you heard the man, don't bunch up. Stay loose. Chief? So as I understand it, hand signals are typically used when you're trying to maintain some degree of silence or maybe your equipment just broke, or it's too loud to hear, or your formation is so spread out it's just easier to lift a hand than yell out really loud. I don't really see the benefit to doing a hand signal and then saying stuff out loud at the same time, especially when they're so close together like this. Okay. And yeah, that's a cool way to pick up a gun, 
but he's still not holding it right. Retrieving now. I'm not entirely sure why the chief is saying everything he's doing. It kind of sounds like he's recording an after action review, but during the action? He's recording footage, Spartans probably have a good memory, so I don't see the benefit to this constant narration. Just review it after and do it then. And stage freeze! Don't say stage freeze, just do it. So nobody seems to know what these artifacts are, but my understanding was that even if Forerunner tech was never activated to this extent before, the UNSC had uncovered Forerunner artifacts before and was able to at least recognize them by their common architecture and design. It's unclear if that's still the case and Master Chief is just uninformed, which is fair enough. There's no reason he'd need to be made aware of them. Or maybe this is indeed the very first Forerunner artifact found. Chief, sit rep. So the chief squad mate asks for a sit rep here. And again, we have military parlance being used, but improperly. A sit rep or situation report is what you would give to a commanding officer who is not present in the current situation. The chief squad mate should already know the situation because she literally just witnessed it. A more appropriate way to phrase this question would just be to say something like, get this, are you okay? You three commandeer the other ship. Take it back to Fleetcom for research and intel. I'll retrieve the object and follow in the Condor. The chief seems pretty confident that his team can commandeer an alien warship and fly at a pretty long distance across the galaxy. How does he know the craft is capable of this, has the necessary fuel or supplies, and is not being tracked by other Covenant forces? Or is it even safe to operate? It seems a lot more reasonable to call in a team of UNSC engineers to give it a once-over before flying it back to your vital military stronghold whose location you're trying to keep secret. And speaking of reach, military fortifications in the 26th century seem to have regressed to some Dark Age era thinking. The reason why cities aren't surrounded by walls like this anymore is because since about the 19th century, artillery has made them obsolete. And as warfare has become more centered on maneuverability and flexibility, not to mention the presence of elements like orbital bombardment, their relevance has only deepened. The only way to protect a city from the enemy is to make sure they're never allowed to come within weapons range. For that, you need starships, not walls with a few turrets on them. Or to put it another way... What about the fortifications in Verdun and Metz? Fixed fortifications, sir. Monuments to the stupidity of man. Now, when mountain ranges and oceans can be overcome, anything built by man can be overcome. Okay, the term Fleetcom has been used multiple times so far with the implication that this is the supreme command of the UNSC or something similar. In the original timeline, at least, Fleetcom was more of an administrative and logistics body. It trained, certified, and provided combat-ready naval forces to UNSC commands, and coordinated Navy activities in support of the Chief of Naval Operations. It was actually one of several organizations that were subordinate to the UNSC Naval Command, which was itself a unified combatant command subordinate to the UNSC High Command. If none of that made any sense, the only important part is that it's super weird for Spartans to be constantly referencing Fleetcom. There's at least a few dozen levels in the UNSC military hierarchy separating them from an institution at this level. This would be sorta, but not really akin to a modern American soldier saying, let's report this to the Pentagon. That's not how it works. There's a few more steps. Excavating for some kind of object. Unclear as to its nature. I don't know what's going on in the future where they feel the need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to displays. A simple rectangle seems to be working for everyone right now. And while I can't say exactly what TVs and monitors are going to look like in the future, I'm pretty sure they're not going to have two rounded corners and a slight curve at the top. I'm also pretty sure they probably won't look like half the information being displayed is shrouded in murky soup. I mean, come on, who is watching video footage and saying to themselves, I really wish we could crop this out so we can't see the top or bottom and have a really broad feathering effect. It's not like visual displays are some brand new technology where we have no idea how it will be applied in the future. We can definitively right now say that this looks dumb. 150 dead civilians in Madrigal is not a good look for your Spartans, Catherine. I don't get why Halsey is being blamed for the actions of her Spartans. She's in charge of a research division. Her only role should be to provide the technology and capabilities to enhance the effectiveness and lethality of the UNSC. Maybe she might have some influence on how her inventions and innovations are used, but the ultimate decision is going to lie with the military or political leaders in accordance with whatever military objectives there are and the laws of armed conflict. 
If a tank, for example, was involved in an incident in which civilians were killed, there would be dozens of other factors to consider before marching up to the designer and demanding an explanation. Even if there were rebels, the Covenant wiped out an entire rebel garrison before Silver Team could intervene. We saved one. Okay, why is Halsey allowed to know all of this? Again, she's in charge of a research division. Admittedly, her work is very important, but her involvement would be limited to operational testing and evaluation. It would be inappropriate for her to be getting live updates like this. We've been fighting these alien creatures for years and we still have no idea what they want, where to find them or how to beat them. Didn't the Covenant pretty famously begin their invasion of the UNSC with the quote, your destruction is the will of the gods and we are their instruments? That alone is pretty indicative of their motivations, while the direction of their advance across the UNSC would imply the general location of their point of origin. I swear this isn't me being pedantic, it's just that so little context is provided on the state of the Human Covenant War at this point, and all these little details just make it even more confusing. One more thing. They want a friendly face talking to the survivor. Miranda Keys knows Madrigal, I've asked her to do the reach out. Okay, this is insane on multiple levels. The UNSC is not just five people. Sir, I have a problem with my time card. So naturally you came to me because this company is just the two of us. There should be a legion of psychologists, trauma therapists, interrogation specialists, and other professionals who are far more qualified than Miranda Keys, who as we'll soon see, has no relevant vocational specialties beyond knowing Madrigal. Is that going to be an issue? No, no, no. But the magical object comes straight to my lab for first analysis upon arrival. Alien tech is Miranda's division. John found it. It belongs here. The Admiral is completely right. Who discovered an artifact is completely irrelevant in determining what department is most qualified to research it. If there is a department dedicated to the study of alien technology, that is where alien technology should be going. But she's so passive in these discussions. Why is an Admiral asking for anyone's permission in the first place? especially from someone with no relevance at all to what's going on. Now granted, I'm not entirely up to date on my covenant theology, but the mere existence of humanity was seen as a blasphemy. For a human to set foot in what is essentially the covenant's most holy place, speaking directly to their high prophets, really weakens the covenant's motivations. As far as I'm aware, UNSC slipspace drives are just too big to be included in dropships like the Pelican. But even if I'm wrong, this is still just a dropship, not meant for long endurance missions. For a single Pelican to travel from Madrigal, a remote backwater world on the frontier, to reach the center of UNSC space seems to imply it's a relatively short trip. UNSC space then feels pretty small, and if that's the case, you have to wonder what's taken the Covenant so long to wipe it out. Whoa, hold up there, past Mark. Slightly less past mark here, and apparently you missed the part where this craft was identified as a Condor, a UNSC dropship that does indeed have a slipspace drive. But I'm going to let you have this one, because while the craft might be technically capable of making the journey, a ship that small would only have the facilities and supplies for a relatively short trip. And for the rest of you, if you could pretend that whenever I refer to this thing as a pelican after this, I am instead talking about the pelican family of dropships of which the Condor is a member, I'd appreciate it. All right, here we go. Now we finally arrive at last to the Templin Institute's most ancient and hated foe, a specter that casts its grisly shadow across my sleepless nights and waking nightmares. Do you see them? Right out in the open like they own the joint? Yellow and black, they stand in place, pretending to warn, protect, or brace. A hazard sign that's lost its way placed without thought where they shouldn't stay. They call to those who pass them by a failed attempt to clarify, but no danger lurks, no threat in sight, just hazard stripes at random height. Tis but a ruse, a game, a lie to all. They report to warn, but in truth just stall. Workplace safety without thought or care. Meaningless, so do not beware. They serve no purpose but to deceive. They prey on those who might believe. A noble cause that lost its way. They're pretty dumb, I have to say. Heed not their call, nor follow their lead. These pointless markings none should need. For danger lies not where they stand. Just hazard stripes across the land. Oh my god, what the hell was that? Okay, clearly I have some deeply rooted emotional issues surrounding hazard stripes that I should probably talk to somebody about, but uh, let me try to explain this more rationally. 
So hazard stripes are important, but only when they're placed with intention. They make sense in factories or workplaces with complex machinery and multiple components in motion, or spaces where people have the potential to act unpredictably or have more touch points with dangerous equipment. But across alternate worlds, hazard stripes are used more like decorations. You often see them on any piece of equipment that has even the slightest potential of causing harm to somebody. On warships from our own world, hazard stripes are usually reserved for things like aircraft lifts, those giant elevators where, yeah, the potential for serious bodily harm is definitely present. Where you don't see them is on the edges of every single bulkhead, which seems to be the case inside this dropship. Their placement in this pelican here is especially hilarious because they've been applied to that indentation in the beam that serves as the most natural point to place your hand, which is what Quan Ha instinctively does. Any other part of the structure would have made more sense, on the bottom part of the beam that's just jutting out into the bay, or the angled part of the top where you might hit your head. Again though, people aren't dumb, they'll figure out to duck without needing a bunch of yellow and black stripes everywhere. So the next time you see hazard stripes, ask yourself, were these placed with intention, or did the designer just run out of ways to make this space look interesting, and decided to fall back on the most overused, generic, needless, sorry, sorry, I've said my piece, I'll move on. How are you feeling? God damn it, there they are again! Fast forward, this is killing me. If you would upload a few words to the other colonies, just explaining what you saw, the brutality of the Covenant, the fact that the Spartans are actually taking them on, I think that it would go a long way to putting aside whatever these politicians are bickering about and helping us focus on the real war. Okay, here we go. So first off, Miranda Keyes looks pretty young to be heading up a division of UNSC research. This would be a senior position within the UNSC Navy. Whoever holds it might be as high in rank as a rear admiral. Head of research would also be more of an administrative position, so her genius at managing Covenant technology or whatever isn't really relevant. This position she has represents the culmination of a career, not something you do in your 20s. But the other issue is, I'm not exactly sure what the UNSC is trying to achieve here. Because Keyes is heading up this research division, I figured this was an attempt to learn about whatever Covenant and Forerunner technology Quan Ha might have witnessed, but instead it seems more like they're trying to convince her to act as an intermediary in negotiations with the rebels on Madrigal. I'm not sure you can overemphasize just how clumsy Miranda's attempt at this is. Demonstrating credibility, building trust, and convincing a hostile group that your government is legitimately interested in addressing their concerns is a delicate and lengthy process. And it's just pretty bad form to try it when the person you want to help you is still covered in the blood of their father. Call me old fashioned. I always find it funny when important divisions or institutions within massive organizations like this only have four people working there. Maybe this is just like Halsey's private lab, but I like to think that those two guys in the background pretending to be busy are responsible for like half the Spartan program. Dr. Halsey, status report. Returning from 23 Labrie, but at Madrigal. Now I can't remember just how often this sort of thing happened in the original timeline, but Master Chief talking directly to the head of the Spartan program is one of those things that makes the UNSC feel very small. Understanding how information is relayed across complex hierarchies is difficult, but I would assume the process would involve collecting all the available information, analyzing it at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels, and then considering its relevance, accuracy, sensitivity, urgency, and any political considerations there might be, before it's finally disseminated to whoever is determined has the need to know. For someone like Halsey, who was not directly in the military chain of command to have a direct line to frontline personnel, undermines established hierarchies, compromises operational security, and creates the potential for political interference, and is just an unnecessary distraction. Okay, everything about this place seems to indicate that it's a pretty sensitive environment. You got guys in hazmat suits, dead bodies being wheeled about, and this guy waltzes in carrying his two uncovered drinks in his regular uniform. Those things he walked through are called PVC strip curtains, and they're actually designed to maintain the integrity of different areas inside a facility, in terms of things like temperature, humidity, and cleanliness. I don't know what Covenant bodies are sensitive to, but I just can't imagine this is the kind of place where some guy, regardless of rank, can just wander into with his open drinks. I sucked up my pride and I really I gave it my best. I believe you. 
selling Dr. Halsey's Spartans to a rebel of all people. As if Halsey had ever do a thing to promote me. That's not entirely Please fair. Don't, don't defend her. She's done nothing but throw roadblocks in my way. Okay, this conversation is a pretty big problem for me. For Miranda Keyes, her father Admiral Keyes and mother Dr. Halsey to all be working in close proximity is a terrible situation for the UNSC. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but military organizations prefer to keep family members separate and avoid putting them within a direct line of command or supervision with one another. Failing to do so might create the appearance of favoritism, which erodes trust, or create the conditions for a conflict of interest. Essentially, modern militaries are trying to prevent this exact conversation from ever taking place. A UNSC admiral making a casual visit to his daughter inside a secure research facility, where they then proceed to openly discuss and at times complain about why she hasn't been promoted, is just gross. This feels like a family-run small business, not a military institution. Quan Ha was badly wounded in the alien attack on Mandrigal. Dad. You didn't order an Article 72. And it gets worse just a few seconds later, when that admiral reveals to his daughter sensitive information potentially damaging to UNSC interests. This is the kind of information that should be on a need-to-know basis, and Miranda does not need to know. If I were in charge of the UNSC, this alone would be enough reason for me to court-martial this guy. Military personnel are held to a higher code of conduct than civilians. And given that Admiral Keyes is talking about the state-sanctioned assassination of a minor in a room full of people during wartime, it might be better to just skip the court-martial and go straight to him dying in a mysterious car accident on the way home from work. We're in a war, Miranda. The future of humanity. What's the point in saving humanity if we're going to give up our own? If you're in charge of a research division studying alien corpses, a division that theoretically might be called upon to develop biological weapons, this is the kind of question you would want to have figured out before you joined the military. And again, for a subordinate to be arguing with a superior, not as if he's an admiral, but her father, is just grossly inappropriate. You ever take that thing off? All of my diagnostic command and control systems run through here. I need it. So, this is one of those things that annoys me, because it's actually pretty interesting, and as far as I know, it's not followed up on. The way Master Chief says he needs his helmet, to me, almost sounds like an addiction. I love the idea that Mjolnir armor is just so sophisticated that without it, you feel deaf, dumb, and blind. Using it goes from this military necessity to something that is actually altering your brain chemistry to the point where your body develops a dependence on it, and the UNSC, desperate to keep as many Spartans in the field as possible, is just happy to ignore this. I always thought the idea of someone in full armor never taking off their helmet was pretty dumb, but I think this is actually an incredibly interesting way of explaining it. The assembled were deemed an imminent threat. My mom seems like an imminent threat to you? What I can see on the ground may not reflect the entirety of the situation. What does that mean? Sometimes others know things I do not. So talking about UNSC black ops to someone with close ties to insurrectionist leadership is not a great idea. I'd probably need to execute Master Chief for this one too if I were in charge. But I'll give him a pass and assume that that artifact scrambled his brain. What I'm more interested in is the line, what I can see on the ground may not always reflect the entirety of the situation. I think this is a pretty brilliant way of describing a complex problem within any military organization. How do you maintain an effective hierarchy in which frontline soldiers trust their superiors, but also feel free to rely on their own judgment and decision making? I wish everyone in the UNSC talked like this. So the idea that the UNSC has an entire article dedicated to murdering people seems kind of ridiculous. That's not the kind of thing you'd want formalized in codes of conduct. However, I did a bit of research and I might be wrong. I think there's a solid explanation here at least. I like to imagine that Article 72 in the UNSC Code of Military Justice or whatever was originally intended to provide a legal framework for field court-martials that might result in the execution of the offender. But, as the UNSC has grown more desperate, they're now using this article to cover up what are essentially murders. It's become a kind of shorthand. We're going to 72 that guy. Roll it back for her. Yes, ma'am. This is a pretty small room for what seems to be the central nervous system of the entire UNSC, and most of it is just empty space. If this were a dedicated briefing area, sort of like the modern US Situation Room, I might buy it. But this really has the feel more of a mission control center. It's also kind of funny that pretty much every monitor seems dedicated to watching the Pelican security cameras. These people know there's a war on, right? There's nothing else going on right now? Can the girl survive this? I thought you wanted her dead. 
UNSC leadership is really rushing into this. Quan is on a pelican, heading for Reach. Why is it so critical she be immediately killed? She's already heading right towards you, just wait a bit. Nobody in this room is fully aware of the situation, and yet they've decided to asphyxiate one of their own precious Spartans on the barest of evidence that he's acting irrationally. Are there no other steps between this guy's and picking up the phone and, I guess we gotta take control of the ship he's on and cut off his air supply? How is that an appropriate response? This is an immense overreaction caused by what's commonly known as... Well, what do you think? It's a prototype. Huh, that's... That's exactly as you described it. Put up the alarm. Scramble everyone to landing bay. Full Soren protocol. Okay, I'm not sure if I'm on thin ice with this one. So if anyone with military experience wants to correct me, I await your judgment. But I always cringe a bit when I hear people talk about protocols. The UNSC especially just loves its protocols. But my understanding is that you learn about protocols during training until they're second nature. The point being that as soon as some special circumstance occurs, everyone knows what to do and can immediately jump into action. So when this admiral says full squadron protocol, it sounds like complete gibberish to me. If a potentially hostile craft is not responding to communication attempts, whoever is in charge of the local air defense shouldn't need to wait on an admiral to tell them to do anything. Knowing what to do is kind of their job. Sorry, past Mark, slightly less past Mark here again. So I know you think she said full squadron protocol because of that transcript you found, but the actual line was full Soren protocol. And while your earlier point is still mostly relevant, it can be helpful for certain protocols, especially those that are used very infrequently, to have some easy to remember name that when invoked instantly brings people up to speed on the current situation and the appropriate response. That said though, I still think the fact you prefaced the Sorum Protocol with full is kind of funny. Does that mean there's a half Sorum Protocol or a three quarters Sorum Protocol? The choice of escort craft also seems pretty strange. Pelicans are dropships, they're not designed for interception. The GATL1 longsword would make more sense. And if you're an interstellar civilization, Better to have your alert craft already in orbit. This is reach after all. Are there not shipyards, space stations, and defense platforms throughout the entire system? Don't move. You're gonna need to listen to me. What did you do to me? Weapons lockers should probably be locked while there's an insurgent on board. This is Mark VI Mjolnir armor. The outer layer is enhanced titanium, you won't even dent it. And maybe don't tell the person aiming a gun at you where the weak points are in your armor. And I might be in the minority on this one, but apart from the inherent stupidity in removing your helmet while someone's pointing a gun at your head, I got no problem with Master Chief taking off his helmet. As previously mentioned, it would be cool if he became addicted to it, but the guy has to take a shower sometime, right? But I admit, I don't have the emotional connection many people do towards the Chief, so if this does annoy you, I get it. I told you this. And you just decided to help me. So what the chief is doing here is probably treason, but since the UNSC is already trying to kill him, or at least asphyxiate him, maybe he doesn't care so much anymore. You are now, in mode. now it always seems strange to me that shooting devices in situations like this makes them work. I thought it was a completely ridiculous cliche. But I have to say, I was wrong about this one. My water heater broke during the editing of this video, so I just shot the hell out of it, and that immediately fixed it. Who knew? Okay, a couple notes here. Somebody should tell these marines they're not in the Napoleonic Wars. Right now, the only guys who don't have their field of fire blocked are those on the far right, and the two warthogs that are positioned way too close to the pelican, to offer effective covering fire if it comes to that. I'd also suggest that if you're looking to capture someone inside a dropship like this, maybe position some people behind it, cause that's where the exit is. This is probably some more treason. The head of a UNSC research division ordering the super soldiers she developed to ignore the military hierarchy and draw their weapons on friendly forces is insane. This to me is a much bigger issue than Master Chief going rogue. I'll say it again, developing weapons does not give you authority over them. 
a competent military organization would have hundreds of systems in place designed to prevent this kind of thing from ever happening. Okay, so that's about it. Those were the 59 things that annoyed me in this, the first episode of The Silver Timeline. If I had to boil it down to some kind of nice broad conclusion fit for the ending of a video, I would say that The Silver Timeline, so far at least, comes across like a period piece where no research was done into the period being portrayed. And to be fair, many of my concerns would also apply to the original timeline featuring the war between the UNSC and the Covenant. But I think the difference is, while that original timeline had plenty of elements I didn't like, it was also ambitious in how it presented them. The UNSC especially, to this day, still comes across as one of the most fully realized and sophisticated fighting forces across alternate worlds. The Silver Timeline, by contrast, feels half-hearted. They're not only getting the answers wrong, they're not even sure about the right questions to ask, so to speak. But that, of course, is just my opinion. And even though, if anyone dares disagree with me, I will spend another 30 minutes discussing everything I found annoying about their argument, I'd like to hear your thoughts. How many of my points did you agree or disagree with? Was there anything I got spectacularly wrong? And would it have been easier for me to just list all the stuff that didn't annoy me? Let me know in the comments below, and until next time, this has been Incoming. What you just watched was the pilot episode of a new series we're calling Everything That Annoyed Me In. This was the first of four new series we're debuting this week, and on Friday, all our patrons will get a chance to vote on which ones become a regular addition to the Templin Institute. If you'd like to take part, you'll find a link to our Patreon in the description below. A pledge of just $2 will get you a vote.